I don't stand behind a podium well, so I hope you don't mind. I'm going to move around a little bit. Um, thank you all for being here today, and we have a small, intimate group today, so we really would like to keep this conversational. So if at any time, uh, whether I remark on something that you have a question regarding, or any of our panelists, my friends who have joined us here today, please don't stand on ceremony. Um, the reason I'm mic'd is because PGTV is filming today. I know that you could hear me without this microphone, so I, I'll try to keep it conversational and not push too hard. But the reason they have us mic'd up is so that they can replay today's conversation on PGTV. So to get us started, I'd like to make certain I've got the right button. Which one, Brenda? There's me. Hi, we don't need to see any more me. I'd like to introduce our panel today. Okay, uh, with us is Tom Deerdorf. He is the assi assistant county manager, and he also um, is the executive director of the Polk Transportation Planning Organization. Also, we have with us today the planning manager for the city of Winter Haven, and we have. Uh, Dr. Joy Jackson, and she's joining us from the Department of Health for Pol Polk County. So she works for the Florida Department of Health with a statewide perspective on health initiatives and brings that expertise to Polk County. Let's talk about what brings me to the table. I am not a professional planner. Um, I am a professional convener. Polk Vision convenes uh, activities around critical issues facing our community. So what we do is we uh, arrive at a collective impact solution from a variety of perspectives, trying to, trying to um, correct, revise, amend, tack back uh, various issues affecting our community. If you'd like a deep dive on our work, I've given you our annual report. But how we arrive at solutions is we convene and align strategic goals. We serve as an intermediary organization between various entities, including the uh, government entity, both municipal and county initiatives. We also serve as a con convener between agencies, agencies that are trying to do good work in the community, such as United Way and all of the participating organizations they have. We also work with the Florida Department of Health, the Transportation Planning Organization, all post-secondary institutions in the county, and um, the, all of the uh, public school network uh, in the county. So we try to bring resources around critical issues facing our community to develop innovative and collaborative solutions for sustaining critical community change. So our role then is to work with all of these really smart people, such as the panelists we have today, and ask them how they would address a critical community issue through their lens. Because what I've learned is that someone working in the Department of Health who is a physician will have a very different perspective on how to solve a community issue than someone that plans roadways for a living, right? Their lens is going to be completely different. But if you can get all of those experts in the room taking off their individual hats and trying to solve a community issue together, you're going to have rich, diverse perspective that brings um, solutions to the table. So what we know, and what I've just described for you, is that we believe that wicked problems, those problems that are so intertwined that it takes a lot of hard work and expertise to unpack them or untie those knots that we may find us in as a community at times, no single organization can do that alone. It takes all of us working together. So, uh, basically, we follow a pattern of learning, engaging, aligning resources, and developing solutions. Again, it's not really about Polk Vision today. It's just us as a convener today around um, managing change in the community. So I would encourage you to please do a deep dive on our um, annual report. But here are, the, 
here is what we convene around. Education, economic development, infrastructure, civic engagement, quality of life, which includes health outcomes, or quality of life, and government. We truly believe, no, I would say not believe, it is our truth that if all of those areas of interest are truly working together in concert, solving community issues, addressing community issues together, if all of those are working at optimum, in sync, we will have arrived at an overarching uh, goal of community prosperity, improving the lot for our community, improving our um, sites for the future. So that is really what Polk Vision is about, is finding ways to work together in a better, sustainable way. So right now, I'm going to introduce Tom Deerdorf, and he's going to talk to you about how the Transportation Planning Organization and uh, the County Transportation Planning Department deals with managing change in our community. Tom. Thank you, Kim. Good afternoon. Part of my job today is to state the obvious, and, and I have to say I feel very qualified to state the obvious, so I'm going to start with that. <laughs> and this is, the, this is my opening statement. We live in a fast-growing region within a very fast-growing state, which we uh, obviously take that for, for granted sometimes if you've lived in Florida for a long time or if you've seen change uh, over time. But I think it's very uh, appropriate to our discussion this afternoon is what does that mean for here, for us here in Polk County? I think it's also um, kind of neat to have this discussion in the Polk History Center where you have a place that's dedicated to preserving a sense of place. So some of my opening remarks are going to be related to that. But if you look at the, the map that's on the left-hand side of the slide, the counties that are colored in yellow and orange are 13 counties within Central Florida that are considered urbanized counties. And today you have about 9 million residents within those 13 counties. And we've looked at our projections or We've looked at population forecasts through the year 2040 or 2045. Over the next 20 years, we're expecting to add about 4.5 million residents to that same area of Central Florida. In news reports or in the media, you may sometimes hear that referred to as the mega region or the growing Central Florida super region. You not only have tremendous growth over the next 20 years, which is going to be something similar to taking the current population of the state of Oregon and moving it here over the next 25 years. You're going to have tremendous growth, but also if you just look at the Orlando metro region, in 2017 they had over 70 million annual, they had over 72 million visitors to East Central Florida, and what that meant for us here in Central Florida was about a half a million uh, tourists or visitors on a daily basis. So we have a uh, very attractive place to live, a very attractive place to visit. What does that mean for us here in Polk County? This is a map that was uh, used at the uh, Board of County Commissioners Retreat a couple weeks ago and it's a map of how Polk County or Central Florida has urbanized through the years. But you can also look at this map and say, well, this is also a map of our rural areas. Uh, if you look at the map, basically from where you're sitting, everything that is a dark color on the map was urbanized in 1980. The lighter colors show our urbanized areas as they've grown through the 2010 census. You also notice on the map the yellow areas which are urban clusters, which are areas that are considered uh, uh, urban because they're, they have a population over 2,500, but they also represent some of our small towns and communities within Polk County. Uh, you can see that we have not only an urbanizing area or an urbanized area in Polk County, 
but we have Central Florida and urbanized area growing together. To the west, we have the urbanized area coming at us from Plant City. The Orlando urbanized area, if you look at the very top of the map, there's a, a dark brown spot. That's where the Orlando urbanized area was back in 1980. It's really grown all the way to Poinciana. So I think there's two things that it really has implications for us today. One is uh, how do we preserve our sense of identity uh, within what is becoming a large urbanized area. Uh, I live in Lakeland. I identify with Lakeland. Uh, 10, 20 years from now, I don't want, despite what the, the, the news media may say, if something happens in Lakeland, it's not Orlando or Tampa, which sometimes already happens. So the question is, how do we preserve our own sense of identity? But also, how do we plan for the future where we have a very urbanized area, but we have a very large county that is going to remain either rural or largely uh, suburban? So again, those are some uh, topics that I think are going to be talked today about in regards to not only transportation, but also uh, broadband or public health. And the last slide I wanted to share was on transportation of the future and how do you take maybe a, a broader view of transportation in the future, a broader view of uh, infrastructure to where infrastructure not only means uh, highways, utilities, but it also means telecommunications, it also means the internet, it also means broadband. One of the things that we're working on right now is our 2045 long range transportation plan update. And it's hard to imagine what we'll be like in the year 2045, but I will say it's going to probably be quite different 20 years from now as far as how people travel and how they get around. The one thing I wanted to leave you with is that a lot of times there's news stories and they focus on autonomous vehicles. Well, you're going to have cars without a driver. Uh, you may see that in the next five years. You may see that in the next 10, 20 years. But on a whole, that's probably not going to be prevalent in Polk County 10, 15, 20 years from now. What we do expect to be very prevalent is connected vehicles. And connected vehicle technology is basically where you have your car is able to talk to other cars so that if you're not paying attention and you may be running through a red light, somebody that's on a cross street, uh, they may know Basically, their car may be worn by that car that's running the red light. Uh, we expect that to have a, a uh, real benefit to uh, traffic safety in the future. So we're going to have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. We're also going to have vehicle-to-infrastructure or infrastructure-to-vehicle communication where uh, instead of speeding up because you think you're going to make that light that's uh, a quarter mile away, the traffic light might be sending a signal to your car that says, no, you need to slow down because it's just getting ready to turn yellow and then red. Uh, also, in the realm of safety, we expect in the future that you'll have vehicles that will be connected with personal devices so that if you have a pedestrian who's getting ready to cross the street, uh, they may get a, a signal on their phone that uh, you know, a car is approaching. Uh, one of the more tragic uh, traffic crashes that we had in Polk County was about 10, 12 years ago where there was the forest fires in the Green Swamp and there was uh, dense fog, visibility was very limited. Today, if you travel I-4, there are uh, you know, flashing signs saying you know, low visibility when this is flashing. I think it's not too far in the future that you're going to have a sensor coming into your car saying that you need to slow down because visibility is at this percent or whatever. Um, the last thing I would say in closing, and I think it kind of leads into Eric's comments, is that as we invest in the future of transportation in Polk County, we need to invest in things like broadband and telecommunications. We need to look, broaden our view of what we need to invest in because if you're going to have connected and autonomous vehicles in the future, uh, you need to have the infrastructure that's going to support that new transportation technology. And increasingly, the lines between transportation and other types of technology are going to be blurred. 
the other thing that I'll just mention in closing is that it's a wonderful exhibit downstairs that talks about the growth of our transportation system through time. One of the things we're facing today is if you look at US 27, that corridor, you can't add more lanes to add more capacity. So as we go into the future, if we have technology like connected vehicles and automated vehicles that make our existing system more efficient, that's going to allow us to keep Polk County more like Polk County is today to kind of uh, maintain what's special about Polk County and maintain that uh, sense of place. So that was my uh, recitation of the obvious and some guesses about the future. And next we have uh, Eric Labby. Um, good afternoon. My name is Eric Labby. I'm the planning manager for the city of Winter Haven. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, I've been blessed to be part of Polk Vision and part of the discussion around um, broadband and uh, technology for, gosh, about 10 years now, probably, um, here in Polk County. Um, I, too, am here to kind of state the obvious uh, and, and piggyback on what uh, Tom was saying. Uh, communities, uh, you know, from the beginning of time, when they grow, they, they invest in infrastructure. Um, those infrastructure networks, you know, could be transportation networks, um, roads, sewers, the, the Roman aqueducts, you know, how do we invest in infrastructure and technology, open space, um, think about the transcontinental railroad. Anytime we invest in some of these um, large scale uh, infrastructure networks, you know, what do they do? And why did we invest in them in the first place? Um, it's about community and it's about connecting people. Um, when you invest in infrastructure, you connect people, you connect ideas, um, you connect regions, you create economic opportunity, um, diversity, you allow people to interact with one, in, with one another. Um, the railroad system allowed us to traverse the nation like we never were able to do before. We opened up uh, the western coast um, to the rest of, of society. Uh, you talk about um, telephone telephony. Uh, people were able to communicate with people on the other side of the planet um, and share ideas and share information and learn and engage people in ways that they never were able to do before. Um, broadband is no different. Broadband is not so new. It's something that's been around for, for many years now. What's new about broadband is how we're using it. It is the next great infrastructure network that we are investing in, in our communities and in our nation, to allow people to engage each other in ways that they've never done before, to allow people to share idea, ideas and to share information and to transfer data, large amounts of data that um, was not possible just a few years ago. When you talk about uh, autonomous vehicles, when you talk about our region and how quickly our region is growing, it's not a conversation of stopping growth or inhibiting growth or trying to prevent growth. It's going to happen. How do we do it smartly? How do we do it in a way that maintains our values as a community? How do we do it in a way that, that maintains our sustainability? How do we plan for roads and water and sewer and infrastructure and the things that we're going to need, preserve our rural heritage, our, our Polk County heritage, and be able to grow our economy um, the way it needs to grow. Broadband is one of the main infrastructure answers to that question. It is the infrastructure network that centers around collaboration. It is how people engage each other. And so whether we're talking about government and being able to provide services better, faster, cheaper, more efficient to the, the constituents who, who pay for those services, whether we're talking about telemedicine, I think um, Dr. Joy Jackson will probably touch on that a little bit, um, think about how many people we have uh, in our region who are incarcerated. Every time one of those people needs to see a doctor, somebody has to get into a van drive down to the facility, pick that person up, along with a couple of guards, take them to the doctor's office, get them treatment, take them back, 
what if we were able to uh, take their blood pressure, have a doctor see them remotely, it's done in 10 minutes, they prescribe the medicine, and we're done. The cost savings in something like that is tremendous. Um, public safety. Broadband is an infrastructure network that will connect fire, police, EMS with building plans, with um, roadway network plans, with our water and sewer and uh, natural gas and, and all of those, think about all those construction plans that we have on file somewhere. Broadband is the infrastructure that when there's emergency, when there's a national disaster, um, our emergency services can essentially push a button and have the entire plan in front of them for the building that they're about to run into. And they know exactly where they're going and how to get there quickly and how to save lives. Um, our energy network, our nation's energy network, uh, we're able to detect outages instantaneously. We're able to correct outages without sending crews. Um, education and commerce, that speaks for itself. That, that really is the, the obvious. We are training our children um, through broadband services. They, they are able to attend a class that's being given in India, it, right here in Polk County. They are able to um, experience things that just a generation ago, my generation, we weren't able to do in the classroom. They can do. So, where we were about 10 years ago or so, and we, when we started this conversation, um, we weren't very well off. We we're in the bottom of the nation when you talk about um, broadband connections, when you talk about STEM jobs, science, technology, engineering, math, um, broadband subscriptions. We were, we were in the bottom 20%, 10% across the nation. And so we set out to try to change that in Polk County, change that discussion in Polk County. And we, as good planners do, we went out and tried to engage the uh, citizenry and, uh, and, and ask people, do you have broadband? Do you use it? Do you use it at work? Do you use it at home? What do you use it for? Um, you know, what is your connection like? We, we collected all this data. We did surveys. We, we did telephone surveys. We did paper surveys. We ate far too many pork sandwiches at community gatherings, just trying to talk to people and figure out what, what do they want, what do they need. And what we heard, you know, often over and over and over and over again was my connection's too slow, I can't get the things done that I need to get done. When I'm in my office, even in downtown, downtown Lakeland, downtown Winter Haven, uh, I'm, I'm an architect and I need to send my plans to my client who's in California. And I upload those plans, it takes forever, forever. I can't get the services that I need. Or I can get those services, but I gotta pay through the nose. So how do we change that discussion? How do we, how do we tackle that subject in Polk County? How do we prepare for the future um, of connected vehicles and connected infrastructure and make sure that we are prepared to, uh, to go down that road? When, when the market is there for connected vehicles? And the answer is broadband. The answer is 5G. Um, how do we proceed as smart cities and smart communities? Uh, we developed a plan. If you're interested in taking a look at it, it's, it's there at those two um, websites. I believe the RPC still has it on their website. I know you guys do. Okay. Um, so check it out. There are goals and strategies and action items. I think there's, uh, I don't know, 27 or so action items in there. Didn't want to bore you with all of those today. But, um, you know, we, in, we have a smart communities team through Polk Vision who is engaged uh, in this discussion uh, monthly. And uh, we're doing a number of, of, of exciting projects uh, throughout the community. And if anybody has any questions about that, you know, later on, uh, we can talk about that. But uh, we are planning, we're engaging, and we're trying to uh, change that situation so that we're not in the bottom 20% nationwide anymore and we're ready to be smart communities and, uh, and have smart infrastructure here in Polk County. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to be here wearing several hats. 
Uh, I'm the director of your county health department. By the way, I'm Dr. Joy Jackson. I'm the director of the health department in Polk and Hardy counties. I'm also been a 30 year resident of Polk County and I'm a primary care physician. So some of my comments may be geared toward healthcare access and, and things that physicians and changes in medicine, but I really wanna to talk to you about population health, which is public health. I thought no better place to start then where did, we, where did we start from? Where did we begin? And uh, so it was sort of interesting to me to do some research on how did public health start in Polk County in Florida, and the legislature created the State Board of Health in 1889 because of yellow fever in Jacksonville and some of our other port uh, cities. The Polk County Health Department began in 1942, uh, and it was interesting looking at back at some of the historic documents we've got from the Polk County Health Department. Some of the health issues experienced by the population then was hookworm, typhus, tuberculosis, infectious diseases and conditions that were transmitted by, by vectors like insects. So life 100 years ago was not super pleasant. There were a lot of mosquitoes. Can you imagine living when there was not air conditioning and, and things to cover your windows and it was very hot? So mosquito-borne illnesses were significant and people died of things like tuberculosis, pneumonia, dysentery. Children's pediatric deaths were usually related to diarrheal diseases. They died of dehydration. So we've come an awful long way in the past 100 years. Also, I need to mention that we now have a lot of vaccines which significantly reduce the risk of illness and death from things like uh, diphtheria, measles, uh, chicken pox, and other things that are going around that we don't see a whole lot of now in the United States, but you still hear of in third world countries or in areas where there's not as good a vaccination rate as we would like to see. So things have changed a lot. Life expectancy in the United States has increased dramatically. In 1850, the average life expectancy in the U.S. was 36 years. 50 years later, it was 47 years. 50, 50 years later, 68 years. And we're now at about 78 years. And we're not the longest living in the world. And in fact, our life expectancy is projected to drop a little bit for two main reasons. And this is across the nation. And that's suicide, and it's the opioid epidemic, okay? So why are we living longer now than we did 100 years ago or more? Advances in healthcare, immunizations, we eat better, have better access to food, we have improved sanitation, we have improved economics, and then a lot of other things that play in the role, including leisure time. In some regards, less stress for survival, but we have more stress in regards to social stressors, and that's a whole other topic in and of itself. We have much safer work conditions. A hundred years ago, there were many deaths on farms from farm-related injuries and accidents. We, you know, we don't hear about that as much. And then seat belts has been tremendous in, in increasing length of life. So what are our modern healthcare issues? The number one cause of death actually since around 1920 is heart disease, cancer, diabetes, chronic lung disease. So how does that differ? In the year 1900, the leading cause of death, death was tuberculosis. And you know, in 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic infected one third of the world's population. And probably 50 million people died across the world. In America, 675,000 people died. We don't hear about flu causing that degree of death in America now because we all strive to get our flu shots and we have a lot of awareness about things to prevent the flu. What we're dying now are chronic diseases. We're living longer and we're living with chronic diseases. So when we talk about, when I, when I am seeing patients in a clinic, I am talking to that patient for their individual health. When I step back on Monday morning into my Department of Health hat, I'm thinking about population health and what's going on with groups of people. Example, infant mortality, uh, maternal child health. How are our elders faring? So th there, there are desired outcomes in public health. And this is a population health model. 
is that we want to live long lives with a good quality of life, and that's what we're striving for. The factors that influence the health of a population are multiple fold. Number one being social and economic factors. Things like our educational level, whether we have jobs, whether we have adequate income, whether we have family and social support and we have a safe community is by far the most important thing in our overall length and quality of life. Next are our behaviors. How do we treat ourselves as a population? Do we use tobacco? Do we eat a proper diet? Do we exercise? Do we avoid excessive alcohol and drug use? And then clinical care, which stunned me. Our health outcomes are less driven by whether we have a doctor and quality care. They're very important than by where you live. Your zip code is a, a really good indicator of how long you're likely to live. And then lastly, our physical environment, also important. Do we have transportation? Do we have safe housing? So when, when we work as a community to impact the health of our community, we're working on population types of things in our infrastructure. So the earlier discussions, do we have adequate safe transportation to get to where we need to go? Do we have broadband internet so we can access health information? Uh, do we have access to one another for social structure? And can we accommodate the needs of multiple types of people? So one thing that we do that's very important is we do an assessment about every three to four years to look at perceptions of the public, perceptions of our key stakeholders, and what does the data show us as far as the health issues and concerns and the things that are going well within the county then we take this to collectively identify things we work on as a community. We are all better as a public health community when we identify key things. Right now we're working on healthy weight. Do you know that right now about 73% of Polk County adults are either overweight or obese? So we have activities to, beginning with children up through the schools and to adults to reduce and change those trends. We know that we have a high infant mortality rate. So my point is our community health assessment and our CHIP process help us decide what we can work on together. And it's not just access to health care, which is important, but it is, um, again, looking at other things in our communities to help support so that we all have the same opportunity for good health and a long life. Not everybody will partake of the opportunities, but what are the networks within the community to do that? Now, changes in health care. Uh, in my 30 years of being around in direct delivery of health care, tremendous changes. Easier diagnostic, better diagnostic. Uh, laparoscopic surgeries instead of a lot of open surgeries. We have electronic health records. I remember the days of everything being in the chart. And if you went to the ER, you couldn't get those records without requesting them and it taking two weeks to get the paper copy. Now we can see electronic health records. If you change a provider or if you go to an urgent care, we can share those things electronically so the speed of knowledge is there. Very, very important. And then as was mentioned, uh, telehealth and access to health care uh, now potentially through your smartphone. What we want is to have an opportunity for those that want a very traditional visit with their physician or their ARNP or their PA to occur face-to-face -face if they want it but they have the opportunity to do things either electronically or on another side if they need to, with people being empowered to making their own health care decisions and to know what is important for their health. So it is, it is, I think that we're at a tremendous, um, I think that we're going to see even more and quicker changes in health care delivery over the next five or ten years, and I think we're just starting to see it now. Right now in Polk County, we do have access to telepsychiatry, and we have that available in our, our underserved clinics. What better place to have a psychiatric visit in the comfort of your home using a computer? So then you worry about HIPAA issues and confidentiality and privacy. So there's a lot of work that's being done to make sure those things are, are occurring. So from the, from the standpoint of healthcare delivery, things are changing. Some things are traditional, but people need to have the opportunity to do more technologically advanced sort of visits 
with smart watches and potentially algorithms that will direct your diabetes care and smart insulin pumps that can read your blood sugar and adjust your, your, your insulin settings to, again, a very, very traditional model. And then from the population standpoint, realizing that the infrastructural things are so important in our health and well-being, our social connectedness, and, and the work of our community partners to help these things occur. So that's all that I have. Thank you very much.